Hey everyone, welcome to Ready to Worship Part 8, Invite the Warrior. I'm going to begin um, with Psalm 24, verse 8, and this is a very important question to this sermon. Who is this King of glory, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle? So we're going to be addressing who God is as a warrior and how God's identity as a warrior affects our worship and how knowing that he wars on our behalf can give us an expectancy every time we worship that we are warring for him, warring with him in advancing his kingdom. So Father, right now I ask that you would um, just move aside all distractions uh, or anything that would attempt to thwart us from uh, receiving the fullness of, of what you want us to receive from you tonight. God, I ask that um, you would keep us in perfect peace as we keep our minds steadfast on you. And Lord, I ask that you would open our eyes to see wondrous things from your word, as it says in Psalm 119, and that you would give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Reveal Jesus in his glory, and God, illuminate your word to us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so God is a warrior. Uh, we see this not just in the verse that I read a moment ago, but in many other places. Here are just a few examples. Uh, Exodus 15, 3, the Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Isaiah 42, 13, the Lord shall go forth like a mighty man. He shall stir up his zeal like a man of war. He shall cry out, yes, shout aloud. He shall prevail against his enemies. Jeremiah 20, 11 says, but the Lord is with me like a mighty warrior. So my persecutors will stumble and not prevail. And um, next two verses I'm going to be reading out of the NIV. Zephaniah 1.14 The mighty warrior shouts his battle cry. Zephaniah 3.17 This is a familiar verse to many of you probably. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. So there are lots of verses that just overtly call God a mighty warrior or a man of war or things of that nature. And there are so many more that talk about him as a savior and as a defender and as a fortress in battle and just like all these other things. So lots and lots of imagery in the Bible about his offensive and defensive role in warfare. So Jesus himself, you know, it's not just talking about God in general or only the Father, but Jesus himself is identified very vividly as a warrior in different places in the Bible. Here's um, a particularly vivid example. Revelation 19, verses 11 through 16. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he may strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This is definitely a picture of Jesus as a warrior. Like, not only is it talking about the fact that he has the sword coming from his mouth and he's, um, you know, the... Um, treading the winepress of the fierceness of God's wrath, but it also just, it emphasizes um, he himself is doing it. Like, there's so many times where it says himself. Uh, he is personally engaged in the battle. He's not just leading the troops, he's engaged in it himself. And um, so, it's important that we understand, you know, God is love, <laughs> and he is a God of justice. And he can be a warrior and a God of love at the same time. He can be a God of mercy and still a warrior at the same time. How does that all work? Well, first of all, there's a clue in here. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war, it says in this passage. And so God alone is able to judge without ever making any kind of a mistake, without ever doing any injustice. You know, Jesus sees the hearts of men. You know, he is omniscient. He knows everything, every intention of the heart, and so he can judge righteously. And he is also good, and he prefers mercy over judgment. 
You know, it talks about how mercy triumphs over judgment. And we see a picture of that, the most powerful picture I can think of in Scripture, um, is where Jesus, who, by the way, out of the three persons of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, he affirms that he is the one to whom all judgment has been given. And you can look that up in the Gospels, that all judgment was given to the Son. Um, and he, as the judge, the righteous judge, the man of war, he, dying on the cross, says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So he delights in showing mercy, even to the point of enduring the most unjust death and forgiving those who killed him. So I trust him, I trust that kind of tested character to administer justice and to administer the fierceness of the wrath of God without doing any injustice in the process. And you might think, well, this is pretty graphic, you know, uh, the robe dipped in blood and all this stuff. Well, consider when God wiped out the world in the time of Noah, what was said of the world at that point was that every inclination of man's hearts was only evil continuously. So the world had progressed to a point where without violating the ability of men to choose between good and evil, there was no way for God to end that cycle of oppression and injustice and sin and the damage that it caused. And so if he left it alone, if he left it unjudged, then it would have only perpetuated. And he did show mercy, we know in Hebrews, um, in the form of Noah being a preacher of righteousness, even when everybody else was going astray. So he maintained a voice of righteousness. Sodom and Gomorrah, he had Lot there. You know, he always had this voice, you know, of, of um, you know, this is the way, walk in it. But when things progress to a certain point, then the most merciful thing to do is to start over and wipe the slate clean. And so there's only, you know, for example, the pre-flood world uh, as an example of utterly doing that. And then in the book of Revelation, this is literally, you know, in response to the rule of the Antichrist and everything that that brings about, where there is, you know, the greatest evil that you can imagine <laughs> ruling, and he's coming to stop that oppression. Um, and we see that um, in other verses too, like for example, um, it says in Psalm 12 verse 5, for the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now I will arise, says the Lord. I will set him in the safety for which he yearns. So he arises on behalf of the oppressed, on behalf of the needy. Um, that's a reason he makes war. And in Psalm 9 verse 12, it says this, when he avenges blood, he remembers them. He does not forget the cry of the humble. So God responds to his people crying out and humbly, especially, you know, requesting his aid in the midst of oppression. You know, think about in the book of Revelation, you know, prior to this scene of him riding in in battle, you know, you have the souls of the martyrs crying out, how long, how long, O Lord? And, uh, and he responds, you know, and ends the oppression that was uh, slaying them. And so, um, this is an example of that fiery zeal that fiery warrior spirit that Jesus exemplifies in uh, Revelation uh, 19. Here, here's an example of it with, uh, you know, kind of equally uh, vivid imagery um, in Psalm 18. And this is just a picture of him, you know, coming to the defense of one of his children. Um, Psalm 18 verses 1 through 18, it says, To the chief musician, a psalm of David, the servant of the Lord, who spoke to the Lord the words of this song on the day that the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. And he said, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. The pangs of death surrounded me and the floods of ungodliness made me afraid. The sorrows of Sheol surrounded me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God. He heard my voice from his temple, and my cry came before him, even to his ears. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of the hills also quaked and were shaken. Because he was angry, smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Coals were kindled by it. 
He bowed the heavens also, and came down with darkness under his feet, and rode upon a cherub, and flew. He flew upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his secret place. His canopy around him was dark waters, and thick clouds of the skies. From the brightness before him his thick clouds passed with hailstones and coals of fire. The Lord thundered from heaven, and the Most High uttered his voice, Hailstones and coals of fire. He sent out his arrows and scattered the foe, lightnings in abundance, and he vanquished them. Then the channels of the sea were seen. The foundations of the world were uncovered at your rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of breath of your nostrils. He sent from above, he took me, he drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy, from those who hated me. For they were too strong for me. They confronted me in the day of calamity, but the Lord was my support. Isn't that amazing? You know, it's like it says in Isaiah 59 verse 19, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. When we are surrounded by the enemy, God wars for his people, for his children. So we've talked about the person of God and and the character of God as a warrior. Um, And so now let's talk about Uh, bridging that to worship. How does that relate to worship? Uh, The first step is we need to understand that wherever God is, the enemy scatters. So um, we see this in uh, the case of the Ark of the Covenant, which the Ark is very interesting. It's this physical object that Moses had built in the wilderness of Sinai. And it was a place where God just established his tangible presence. So it was this concentrated area you know, around this physical object, the Ark, um, where his presence dwelt, where his glory dwelt. Only the high priest could go into the place where the Ark was once a year, and um, only under certain procedures. You know, he had to to be careful about how he did it. And um, the people who carried the Ark had to put it on long poles so they wouldn't actually touch it. It was bad news if you touched the Ark. Uh, There was an example of that in David's time. Didn't end well for the person who touched it. And so, every time... The ark, you know, representing, but also, you know, containing um, a measure of God's presence. Every time that was picked up, this is what would happen. Uh, In Numbers 10.35, it says, Whenever the ark set out, Moses said, Rise up, Lord. May your enemies be scattered. May your foes flee before you. And it's interesting because Israel never went anywhere in those years without carrying the ark up with them. You know, the ark would go forth and the enemy would be driven back. And, um... So, there was a situation, though, much later, um, in the time of um, Samuel's youth, the, uh, the judge Samuel's youth, um, that uh, the Philistines actually captured the ark. And this was a situation where, you know, Israel was in such rebellion against God that he even allowed this place of his presence to be captured to get their attention. And so, it says in 1 Samuel 5, 1 through 5, after the Philistines had captured the Ark of God, they took it to Eb- from Ebenezer to Ashdod, so into Philistine territory. Then they carried the Ark into Dagon's temple and set it beside Dagon. Uh, so Dagon is like a chief idol of the Philistines. When the people of Ashdod rose up early in the morning, there was Dagon fallen on his face um, on the ground before the Ark of the Lord. They took Dagon and put him back in his place. But the following morning, when they rose... There was Dagon, fallen on his face on the ground before the Ark of the Lord. So, two mornings in a row. (laughs) His head and hands had been broken off and were lying on the threshold. Only his body remained. That is why, to this day, neither the priests of Dagon nor any others who enter Dagon's temple at Ashdod step on the threshold. Um, And uh, it's interesting because they even came up with this euphemism for the Philistines after that that appears in some of the prophetic books of, you know, basically those who step over the threshold. So... It's crazy that they were clinging so much to their idolatry that even when their, when their god was essentially vanquished, you know, their, their idol was smashed before the ark, then they just basically said, oh, look, a piece of our god touched the threshold, so now we're going to always step over thresholds in reverence to our broken god. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, these are examples where the presence of god drives back the enemy. And um, this is true in a spiritual sense as well as in a physical. Um, as a matter of fact, there was spiritual warfare going on in that whole incident with Dagon. Um, we know from Deuteronomy 32, verses 16 through 17, and also from 1 Corinthians 10, 19 through 20, that um, idols are demons. And um, you might be like, what? That's weird. <laughs> you know, but uh, I'll just read these verses to you. Deuteronomy 32, 16 through 17 says, They provoked him to jealousy with foreign gods. With abominations they provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to demons, not to God to gods that they did not know, 
to new gods, new arrivals that your fathers did not fear. So it's equating demons to these idols, these foreign gods. Um, and the same thing in the New Testament. Um, Paul affirms the same idea in 1 Corinthians 10, 19 through 20. What am I saying then? That an idol is anything or what is offered to idols is anything? Rather, that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. So Paul realizes, you know, he, he acknowledges, okay, so the statue is just a statue, but as you're worshiping the statue, you're worshiping a demon. And so demons flee at the presence of God. You see this so clearly in the case of Jesus. So those were examples of the ark, which is, you know, a little bit more of an abstract idea because it's a, it's a place where God's glory dwelt. And that drove back, you know, demons and, and defeated strongholds of the enemy. But um, take a look at what happens when Jesus himself, you know, fully God and fully man, goes places where the enemy is present, where demons are present. Um, Mark 3, verses 9 through 11. So he, Jesus, told his disciples that a small boat should be kept ready for him because of the multitude, lest they should crush him. For he healed many, so as many as had afflictions pressed about him to touch him. And pay attention to this part. And the unclean spirits, whenever they saw him, fell down before him and cried out, saying, You are the Son of God. And you see other examples, like specific examples, where Jesus would show up and not only would demons fall down and spontaneously cry out things like, You are the Son of God, but they would also, you know, in, in some situations, like, you know, they would convulse people or um, they would just essentially go crazy. <laughs> they couldn't handle his presence. And um, here's a really interesting example. Um, Luke 18, verses 26 through 31. Then they sailed to the country of the Gadarenes, and this is uh, Jesus and his disciples, which is opposite Galilee. And when he stepped out on the land, there met him a certain man from the city who had demons for a long time. And he wore no clothes, nor did he live in a house, but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out, fell down before him, and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for it had been, excuse me, for it had often seized him, and he was kept under guard, bound with chains and shackles. But he broke the bonds and was driven by the demon into the wilderness. Jesus asked him, saying, What is your name? And he said, Legion, because we are many. Um, and they begged him that he would not command them to go out into the abyss. And Jesus does deal with these demons. He sends them to a herd of pigs um, and frees the man, and then the man is delivered and wants to follow Jesus. Um, so think about that, you know, it's like this man is so empowered by the demonic that, you know, even just like Roman guards could not contain him. You know, he, he was, um, he was a menace and, uh, and he would break chains, but then Jesus shows up and he just falls to the ground. He can't do anything except beg for mercy from the judge of, you know, all the earth. And so, um, that's what happens when God is present, you know, um, so, remember, you know, God is a man of war. <laughs> where he is, the enemy is scattered. And where is he? One place where he is is he inhabits our praises. We've established this in another one of our teachings in this series. But um, in Psalm 22, verse 3 to review, it says, But you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. So God's enthroned in the praises of our people. When we worship him, when we praise him, he establishes his presence in that place. And of course, you know, God's omnipresent, I'm not saying otherwise, but there is something about when he asserts his presence in a certain location, and that's what happens um, when he is enthroned in our praises. So in corporate worship, especially, you know, have faith that he is there. Um, we'll back that with this verse as well, Matthew 18, verse 20, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. And um, we'll find some examples where even just one person worshiping uh, made a, a huge difference and drove the enemy back and established God's kingdom in a, in a warlike way. Um, and so worship not just confuses the enemy or, you know, drives him back or scatters him, it also defeats the enemy. And there are examples in the Bible of worship being the catalyst for, um, you know, like a physical victory, but also for a spiritual victory. So here's some physical examples. Um, my favorite is uh, in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 1 through 30. Um, and this is uh, an episode where King Jehoshaphat is surrounded by this enormous army. And um, I'm just going to read some excerpts from it because it's a long passage, but I'd encourage you to read the whole thing. 
In 2 Chronicles 20 verses 1 through 4, it says this, It happened after this that the people of Moab with the people of Ammon and others with them besides the Ammonites came to battle against Jehoshaphat. Then some came and told Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, from Syria. And they are in Hazazon Tamar, which is En Gedi. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. So Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord, and from all the cities of Judah they came to seek the Lord. Fast forwarding to verse 12, Jehoshaphat says this, O our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Now, skipping ahead again to verses 20 through 25, 21 through 25. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord and who should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army and were saying, Praise the Lord, for his mercy endures forever. Now when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, and they were defeated. For the people of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir and utterly killed and destroyed them. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, they helped to destroy one another. So when Judah came to a place overlooking the wilderness, they looked toward the multitude, and there were the dead bodies, fallen to the earth. No one had escaped. When Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away the spoil, they found among them an abundance of valuables on the dead bodies and precious jewelry, which they stripped off for themselves, more than they could carry away. And they were three days in gathering the spoil because there was so much. So what a reversal. They go from fearing for their lives to being so enriched by the spoil of the enemy armies that they didn't even have to fight that it took them three days just to collect the spoil. And all of this because they surrendered the battle to God and they worshipped him. And I love, you know, what a terrible military strategy to send uh, musicians and singers out in front of an army. You know, they'd just be cannon fodder. Um, but that's what they did. They did it faithfully to the Lord. And I love how, as they're worshiping, you know, people can kind of be like, you know, uh, I, I guess assume that like in order for a, a worship song to really be like a warfare song or something like that, to really do war for the kingdom, you know, like it has to be intense. It has to be about battle themes. It has to be, you know, something that stirs people up. Um, in like an aggressive kind of a way or something like that, you know, but um, spiritually aggressive, I should say, not physically aggressive, but, um, but here, like what they were singing was just praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. You know, it wasn't about him defeating the enemy. It wasn't coming to him, even expressing their need. They were just declaring who he is and praising him for it. Praise him because he is merciful. And that did the trick. Um, and you see this, this same kind of an uh, example, you know, I guess in a looser way, you know, so take this uh, or leave this, but think about with Jericho, you know, they lift up this shout, which it doesn't explicitly say it was a shout of praise, but I suspect it was, and then the walls fall down. So that's another example where um, potentially worship, you know, is the catalyst for God physically defeating the enemies and physically knocking down, in this case, like a huge impenetrable structure. Like that was ridiculously miraculous. Um, but it's true on a spiritual level too. So here are examples where worship specifically gained the high ground and even the victory in spiritual battles. So in the case of King David and Saul, um, it says this about King Saul, and this is after King Saul basically just kind of gets, you know, more or less um, overcome by jealousy and, and he starts to really lose uh, even his sanity. Um, as he goes through this dark transformation that eventually leads to him, uh, you know, consulting a medium and losing the kingdom and, and um, dying in the battlefield. Um, but um, in 1 Samuel 16, verses 14 through 18, and then verse 23, it says this, But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a distressing spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servants said to him, Surely a distressing spirit from God is troubling you. Let our master now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is a skillful player on the harp, and it shall be that when he uh, that he will play it with his hand, uh, when the distressing spirit from God is upon you, and you shall be well. So I think this is interesting that Saul's men they just knew that this was a principle that you get somebody in there to worship on an instrument, and it can actually alleviate demonic oppression. You know, drive the enemy back where the spirit of the Lord is established in worship. So. Um, Saul said to his servants, Provide me now a man who can play well and bring him to me. 
Then one of the servants answered and said, Look, I have seen a son of Jesse of the Bethlehemite, who is a skill excuse me, who is skillful in playing, a mighty man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a handsome person, and the Lord is with him. Skipping ahead to verse 23, And so it was, whenever the Spirit from God was upon Saul, that evil spirit that the Lord was uh, allowing to visit him, um, that David took a harp and played it with his hand. Then Saul would become refreshed and well, and the distressing spirit would depart from him. So we know from other situations, David's not merely playing, he's worshiping. Because David was a worshiper. He was a psalmist. He wrote psalms, he worshiped out in the field, and that was how he would have been known as a harpist, because he would worship God out in the field as a shepherd. And so when he comes and establishes that presence of God, they recognize of him, the Lord is with him. So, you know, he's like we are, we carry God's presence. We are like the Ark of the Covenant and where we go and especially where we worship, you know, even David is one individual man worshiping before the king, you know, that was demolishing the, the territory of the enemy, the stronghold of the enemy and causing him to flee anytime David did it. Worship does more than just drive the enemy back. You know, it establishes a place of fellowship with God and from that place of fellowship, God can give you clarity and strategy and really just kind of pull your head above the water from, you know, the fog that the enemy creates around you. Um, and so here's a situation where, you know, it seemed like kind of the heavens were sort of open um, and, uh, and victory was gained even just on an internal level um, as a result of some worship. So in 2 Kings uh, 3.15, what you have is a situation where uh, King Jehoshaphat and uh, an evil king of Israel, they're allied against another army and um, their, their armies are thirsty and they need some kind of help from the Lord. And so they call on Elisha and, um, and Elisha is a little bit, you know, frustrated by the situation because the king of Israel is so evil. He even says of him, like, you know, uh, as surely as the Lord lives, if it weren't for King Jehoshaphat's presence, I wouldn't even look at you or acknowledge you. Um, but then he says this in verse 15, but now bring me a harpist. And while the harpist was playing, the hand of the Lord came on Elisha. So that's the that's the 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 sort of like um, pivoting moment in this this battle where they're about to you know succumb to thirst and definitely like get mowed down by the enemy army, but then when the worship occurs, like Elisha knows, like King Saul's men did, that where worship is, there's there's just more breakthrough. There's more of that open heaven for God to establish His kingdom and His purposes, and so he asks for the harpist in order for him to more easily get the prophetic word. And so he gets the prophetic word, and that prophetic word is military strategy. He says, uh, now fill the valley with ditches, and then the Lord supernaturally filled the ditches with water, and then the uh, Israelites and uh, Judeans drank the water and were, you know, revived. But then the opposing army just supernaturally, they looked at the water and it looked like blood to them. And so they said, that's blood. These other kings have killed each other and, you know, their armies have killed each other. And so let's just go and collect the spoil. And so they came in unsuspecting and were wiped out by um, the Israelites and Judeans. So again, the pivot point of that whole battle was just worship. <laughs> worship opening up the heavens and helping the prophet to get the breakthrough from God um, in dire straits. Thinking about Elisha in that story reminds me of a time that I went to Cambodia. It was my first mission trip. And um, pretty early on in the trip, I got typhoid fever. But at the time, um, I was just being treated in this little rural area. I was in an orphanage and there was a doctor uh, a couple houses down and, you know, the doctor, you know, he didn't have an advanced medical degree. I saw his like secondary nurse diploma on his wall. And um, he thought that I had malaria. Um, but, uh, then I was also told, well, I should probably go to the city and get a second opinion and get treatment there. But then other people were saying, no, you need to stay here and just stick with this doctor because, you know, traveling would be harder for you and you got everything you need here. And so I was forced to make this decision and, um, you know, with malaria and with typhoid fever, like if they're untreated, you can die from them. Uh, you know, with modern medicine, you're not likely to end up in that situation, but I knew that this was potentially life threatening. And I just felt really, really physically fatigued and really mentally fatigued by the illness. Um, and I was having a lot of trouble making a decision about whether to stay there or, or go to the city. And um, after like two or three days of that, I realized, you know, wait a second, this isn't just like a physical thing going on. Like, I feel like there's a spiritual component to this too. Like, I'm becoming aware of just like a lot of oppression that's clouding my judgment and making it difficult for me to make a decision. And so I was in a very dark place there. 
you know, just um, lots of idolatry around and lots of poverty and just, you know, um, and, uh, and so I was like, okay, this is really hostile territory. And um, it would make sense that I'm experiencing something beyond simply, you know, the fatigue mentally and physically of the illness. And so I couldn't get any breakthrough in prayer, really. But one night I just really, really pressed in and just prayed hard and worshiped hard. And there was like this crescendo as I was just like going deeper and deeper into the worship and into the prayer. All of a sudden it was like a cloud broke open and just like, you know, like they just, it's like clouds parted. And, um, and I just had the solution. I knew I needed to go back to the city and uh, see a doctor there. But not only did I have that, I had strategic prayers that God just kind of downloaded to me about how to deal with the spiritual oppression that I was facing. And so morning came um, and I went back to the city and within, you know, just a couple of hours of driving toward the city, I started to feel much better just being out of that oppressive environment. And physically I mended to the point of like going from barely being able to eat to being able to have full meals for the first time in days. And like, as soon as I was out of that oppressive environment, you know, according to the strategy God gave me, you know, I was, immediately recovering. And then I got the right diagnosis. And so instead of kind of languishing under malaria treatment when I actually had typhoid fever, you know, who knows how that would have ended. Instead, I was getting, uh, you know, appropriate medical care back in the city. And then when I got well and I went back to the orphanage, I found that the spiritual oppression in that environment, it just felt totally different. It felt like it had left. And so the strategic prayers that I ended up getting uh, ended up having um, a powerful effect you know, um, even beyond simply just getting the strategy uh, for my treatment. And, um, and the whole trip turned around once I returned, um, having gone through that battle. So um, worship is key to the battle. And it's important to know every time you go into worship that we are actually trained for warfare and called to be warriors. So um, God trains us for war. Psalm 1839 says, For you have armed me with strength for the battle. You have subdued under me those who rose up against me. So he arms us with strength. You know, he prepares us for the warfare in that way. And in Psalm 18, 32 through 35, it says, It is God who arms me with strength and makes my way perfect. He makes my feet like the feet of deer and sets me on my high places. He teaches my hands to make war so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. You have also given me the shield of your salvation. Your right hand has held me up. Your gentleness has made me great. So he trains our hands for war. Like he wants us to make war and he teaches us how to do it. Um, and he equips us with a shield of salvation. And I love how it says in your gentleness, you make me great. Like, you know, God's patient with us. He gently uh, trains us and makes us great. Um, and so we are trained for warfare. We're also equipped for warfare. And um, here's some examples um, of how God equips us for warfare. Ephesians 6, 10 through 17. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, here's the equipment. Take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist in truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. So a full suit of armor that God equips us with. So do you think he wants us to be warriors? Yeah, I think he wants us to be warriors. Um, in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 4, it says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Again, linking our warfare back to the spiritual warfare that we do. And, you know, if you're ever like, okay, well, I don't know how to fight against, you know, the principalities, powers, authorities, whatever, worship. That's one of your key weapons. That is absolutely a key weapon, as we've already established. And, um, and every time you worship, you are doing war. You know, whether you are singing about warfare, you know, or whether you're just doing what the, the uh, worshipers in King Jehoshaphat's army did and just saying, praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. You know, no matter how you worship him, it is warfare. Um, so we are guaranteed victory in Jesus. So let that be confidence if this, um, you know, a source of confidence if, if this idea of warfare 
uh, is intimidating to you, we are guaranteed the victory. Um, in Romans 8, 37, it says, Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So not just conquerors, not just the victors in the battle, but more than conquerors through him who loved us. Um, and it's through him who loved us. You know, that takes some pressure off. <laughs> He's the big guns. We don't have to be. Um, 2 Corinthians 2, 14 says, Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. If you are being led of him, he always leads us into triumph. And he may even lead you into situations that feel like failure, but, you know, that's teaching, that's discipline, that's learning from situations where he needs us to come to the end of ourself. And moreover, even when we do just utterly mess up, um, here's a couple of scriptures to encourage you that he does lead you into triumph, even in spite of that, you know, uh, and especially if you're quick to repent. Um, then that can expedite the triumph. But, you know, in Romans 8, 28, it says that God works all things for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purposes. And um, in one of the Psalms, I can't remember which one, it's somewhere in the 30s, though, I think, um, though the righteous man stumble seven times, he will not fall utterly. You know, God sustains us. As it says in Psalm 16, he maintains our lot. You know, so we can have this confidence in going into battle that um, he upholds us and preserves us. Matthew 16, 18 says this, and uh, he's speaking to Peter here, after Peter makes the great confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Um, it says, Jesus speaking to Peter, And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And pay attention to this part. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And more famously, the King James says, And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So, pay attention to that. The church, you know, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. So, is it that the church is defending against hell? No, it's the other way around. The gates of hell and the church is battering those gates and they will not prevail. Um, and just remember in all of your battles that as David said in 1 Samuel 17, 47, when fighting Goliath, he said this, um, the battle is the Lord's. The battle is always the Lord's. So make sure that you align yourself continually with him. You know, I want to be on his side in every single battle. I want to be actually, you know, um, representing him well. And I want to be, you know, carrying out his purposes rather than walking in rebellion. I want to always be keeping in close step with my commander. And in everything, remember that your greatest military strategy is to invite the mighty man of war. So... I read at the very beginning a couple verses out of Psalm 24. Here's a larger passage of Psalm 24. This is um, verses 3 through 10. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. So here, who may ascend into the hill of the Lord, he who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This goes back to an idea that we talked about in previous sermons of, you know, true worship, offering yourself, you know, truly walking with clean hands and a pure heart, you know, so you have at least an individual represented here of somebody who wants to worship God with their life, to encounter him, to ascend his hill. And then in the next little segment, you have, this is Jacob, the generation of those who seek you, who seek your face. So now we're talking about a generation seeking God. And what happens when God's people become a generation who seeks him? You know, what happens when we as the church against uh, whom the gates of hell will not prevail? What happens when we unite and we worship and enthrone him in our praises? This is what happens. The king of glory shall come in. And when the king of glory comes in, then he is the mighty man of war who will drive back the enemy and he will establish his kingdom. And that is what revival looks like. Revival occurs, you know, when we repent and we seek his face and we turn from our wicked ways. And then he comes and he heals our land and he forgives our sins and everything it talks about in Second Chronicles 7.14. And so could we not do that 
from the place of worship? Could worship not be our primary weapon, you know, in that sense? In that if we come together in truly worshiping him to the point of seeking clean hands and a pure heart, you know, repenting, not just offering a vain song, you know, could worship be the rally point that invites the king of glory and when he enters, you know, establishes his kingdom and drives back the enemy throughout, you know, whatever extent of our society we invite him to do that in. So um, let's end with prayer. Lord, I ask that you would increase our faith that when we worship, you war. God, increase our faith that your kingdom is established where we carry your presence. And God, I pray that tonight you would use these words to train our hands for battle. God, that you would use these words to stir up a fire in our hearts. Um, and Lord God, to um, just give us like a marching rhythm to battle. I pray that every time we worship you, we'd have confidence that you change things wherever we worship, whenever we worship, that your kingdom advances, that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty in God, capable of demolishing strongholds. And Lord, we love you and we thank you that even in something as simple as loving you and praising your character, praising your nature, that you can fight for us. And God, I pray for everyone here uh, listening to this who doesn't feel protected, who doesn't feel defended, who doesn't feel um, like their hands have been trained for battle. Lord, I ask that you would give courage. Um, and Lord, that uh, we would all be able to see a change, even in our own homes, even in our own churches, Lord, where where sometimes it feels like change is impossible um, in our surroundings, in our work, in our school, whatever it is, Lord, that, that we would be able to worship you and be able to see that as we worship you with faith, that you are changing things, that you are turning things around, that you are bringing freedom, and that you are protecting us. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.